Welcome back to The Forge. So today's lesson is making punches. So when it comes to punches, we use them every day. I've got square ones, round ones, slot punches of all different shapes and sizes. And what we're gonna be doing today is hand punches because you're holding on to them with your hands. Now, I'm gonna start off with 160 mil of EN8. You could use EN9, you could use EN45. Any medium spring steel will be absolutely fine for making punches. If you wanna go really fancy, you could use some H13. So I'm gonna get this warmed up. I'm gonna make myself another square punch. So the principles are pretty much the same, no matter which punch you're making, uh, it's just a different shape taper on a bar. Um, if you wanna see those videos, I'll stick a link to the, in the description below to my taper forging lessons. Okay, so let's get my EN8 warmed up, sticking it in the fire. Don't wanna burn the outside because this is a spring steel. So uh, I wanna warm it up a bit slower. Don't just give it full throttle. So if you can't get your hands on uh, good quality EN9, EN45 or EN8 off the bar, off the steel rack, then you know there are other sources for it as well. Uh, things like old leaf springs off cars, um, coil springs off older cars so certainly work really well. Um, springs of old farm machinery, again, you know, it's all that medium sort of spring steel. So um, you should be able to get your hands on some somewhere. Scrapyards are a brilliant one for it as well. Okay, so my bar's warmed up to a nice bright orange. Out on my anvil, I'm gonna lift it up slightly, bring the hammer down at a slight anvil, angle, and pinch that stock. Working on two sides. And I wanna forge myself a nice taper. I'm using my three pound ball paint. Give me a bit more force. Sort of average two pounder. I'll have to go back in my forge. I keep looking at the ends because the last thing I want to happen is to create a fold in the end, which will leave a defect. So uh, if it do start to roll forward, you need to dress that end in. Okay, nice and hot. Careful not to burn your stock. Spring steels, higher carbon steels, have a lower melting temperature and burning point than mild steel does, which is what we're normally forging. There we go, I'm down to sort of 15 mil there. I'm gonna take it down to probably about six mil square on the end. Be a nice sharp one. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, tapering down nicely. Working on all four faces now, so I'm keeping my uh, taper nice and central. It's central-ish. Um, I'll worry about that at the end, tidying it up. Um, we're getting there, I'm down to about 10 square on the end. I'm gonna bring my taper slightly further up. Um, I don't want it super long, but equally I don't want it really stubby. Um, otherwise it sort of countersinks rather than punches and you get a lot of resistance when you're driving it through thicker bar. So uh, I'm gonna taper that slightly longer. Keep your work clean, keep your fire clean. Keep your handle clean. Okay, again then. Right, let's go a little bit finer on the end. I am reasonably happy with how this is looking. All I need to do now is strain up a little bit more. Make sure my tape is in the middle. Make sure my point's in the middle of my bar. So the best way to make sure something's straight is to hold it up to eye level, look down the length, and you'll be able to see where the bends are. If you hold a piece of steel up in front of your face like this, you can tell it's bent, but you won't be able to see exactly where you need to tap it with a hammer. So I'm pretty happy with how that looks. Right. Okay. 
Now then, because this is a hot punch and it's going to be coming into contact with hot steel, there's absolutely no need to do a heat treatment on this. Um, any hardening and tempering is just going to be taken out uh, by the fact that it's going to come into contact with hot piece of steel. So the only heat treatment I actually need to do with this is to normalize it. So I'm just going to warm it up until I get a nice even orange on the whole piece. I'm going to give it a wire brush and I'm going to leave it on the side of my fire to cool down. And then we'll dress the back end. Now, while I'm waiting for my uh, punch to cool down, there's another essential bit of kit to go with it. And that is, of course, a bolster plate. Now, these are basically bits of scrap metal with uh, different sized holes in them to marry up with your punch. Um, and the purpose of these is to support your material while you're drifting your holes. Otherwise, all that extra material just gets sucked into the hardy hole or into the pritchel, distorts the shape of your holes and doesn't make them look very nice. So that's a round one for a round punch. I've obviously got my square punch. I need to make a square one. So I've got a scrap, eight inches long, 40 by 12, 200 mil, and we'll punch some holes in there and drift them to the size. Now my new bolster plate's warming up in the fire and be ready in a second. So while I wait for that, I thought I'd talk to you about mushrooming. Now, back end of your tools, they're always gonna mushroom. And it's better in many ways to have a softer tool because it won't leave as many marks in your hammer face. I typically use a different hammer when I'm punching and drifting holes. Um, so that I'm not marking up and damaging my actual forging hammer that I use every day. Because any mark in your hammer face, you're going to transfer that into your work. So, there's a pretty new punch. That one's not been around very long. Obviously, after a while, they start to mushroom. As they mushroom, they start to develop cracks. And eventually, they end up looking like this. Now, when they get to that stage, you want to be really careful because you will end up knocking chunks off and they fly across the workshop like little bullets. Um, and occasionally you'll end up digging them out of your forearms. So I strongly advise when they get to that stage, you trim the ends off with a cutting disc on an angle grinder and relinish them. So they go back to looking like that. By the looks of it, my bar's off. Right, bar's nice and hot. Give it a clean, make sure there's no crud on the face. I want these somewhere in the middle. So always supporting my punch with my hammer. Put a mark in it, have a look. Make sure you're happy before you go full, full tilt. Half a dozen hammer blows or so, and then cool your punch down. Uh oh, we have a casualty, folks. <laughs> right, back to it. Ignore our casualty. Okay, so I'm punched all the way down until I've got a lot of resistance and I'm getting a lot more rebound. That's telling me that my punch is pretty much at the anvil. Now, what I can do, flip it over. While you're down at the edge, you can see the shadow, and then I'm aiming for the center of my shadow, and drive my punch into it. Now, it's quite cold, but that's absolutely fine. Because it's cold, it gives me more of a shearing action on the piece of steel. Ready? And knocks my wedge out, my uh, knocks the slug out of my piece of steel. Okay, so that's my first hole in my bolster plate. I'm going to put three in there, and I'm going to drift them to different sizes because there's no point having the same size in the bolster. You want lots of different ones. Now, if you're working on wider stock, big flat stock, a uh, pair of farrier tongs are actually really helpful rather than trying to find really big wide. Um, bolt jaws and stuff. We interrupt this program for a slight interlude. How to remove the crud out of the middle of your hammer so you can rehandle it and use it again tomorrow. Right, good for a new handle. Round two. Hopefully we don't kill a hammer. Oh, 
Buffer does not hammer blows, and then cool down your punch. Always remember to cool down your punch. Nothing more embarrassing than getting a punch stuck in the piece of steel, especially if you're doing a demonstration. Over to Miyadi. One good whack. Two good whacks. Nope, not coming loose today. Cool down your punch. There we go. Slugs out. Not going to bar on the end. We'll straighten it out of this stage. Good, nice and flat. So I'm gonna leave the first hole I did at eight square, quite happy with that. This one is a little bit bigger. I'd say it's probably about 10 square. I'll need to drift that out to size. So I'm gonna find myself a drift and we'll throw one through the hole. Now, when it comes to drifting, uh, your drifts, I just make these out of mild steel. I don't see any point in making them out of high carbon steel. They tend to get stuck, they tend to get bent, they get an absolute beating and they break and get absolutely mullered. So I don't tend to worry about them. Um, you want a nice slender taper so that it'll fit into the size hole that you're going to be dropping it into. Um, you want probably at least an inch of parallel section and then a negative taper on the back end so that it will release from the hole and you don't have to then try and knock punches in and stuff. Um, I've got an 8, I've got a 10, I've got 12, 16 and all the way up to probably 40 or 50 square in my workshop. Um, now, when I am punching and drifting, I do tend to use a slightly larger, heavier hammer. Uh, this one is probably around three pounds. Um, I, there's not much point in trying to punch and drift using a smaller hammer. You know, if you can't manage a one and a half pound hammer, um, you're probably in the wrong game. You want to be jumping up to like two and a half, three pound, four pound hammers, um, just so that you're putting as much energy in nice and quickly. You're using the most of that heat and you're moving that material out the way. Um, so let's get on with this. Okay, so my end hole is up to size, so I don't need to worry about that one. So I'm going to drift this one out to a 10. I'm going to do it over the Pritchell hole so the material is supported. Drop my 10 mil drift in the hole. Start that off. Grab it with a pair of tongs. And I'm moving it around the Pritchell so that I'm getting a bit of support on all sides. And there we are, straight out. What I normally do is flip the bar over, flatten it off. So by flattening it back off, it does change the, the hole slightly. So it's always worth drifting your holes from both sides. So there's my 12, uh, sorry, 10 mil hole. That'll do nicely. And we'll punch one more and drift a large one on the far side. Okay, so my new punch is cooled down. Uh, so for the last hole in this bar, I'm gonna use a new one. All I've gotta do first is to square up the actual business end and I'm gonna dress off the back corner to minimize that mushrooming. So over to the linisher. So the last thing I did there when I was dressing my punch on the linisher was to take off those really sharp corners. I've just put like a two mil radius on those square edges um, because if you've got a really sharp 90 degree corner, what you'll most likely do is introduce cracks and splits into your punched holes. So just by have radiusing off those corners a little bit, you'll help minimize that in your work. my racing punch. Now because my chip punch is nice and fine on the end, I do have to keep quenching it quite often to make sure it's not overheating. You can see there it's picked up a little bit of color. So you've got to make sure you're cooling them down. But you can see there that gives me a nice square hole 
uh, about a quarter of an inch in, um, in size. And I'll drift that out now to uh, probably 12 mil. Okay, so start off nice and small. Chuck my eight mil in there. Moving it around on the brick chill, support that stock. Just it off, back into the forge. Okay, time for a bigger drift. So hopefully this punch, this drift fits in the old, yes. Right, well there we go guys, there's my new punch. Pretty happy with that. It's a bit of a racing punch because it's so fine on the end. But you, if you're going to be making things like um, nail headers, then you're going to want a nice fine punch. And there's my finished bolster plate to go with it. Still a little bit on the warm side. I've got an 8mm, 10mm and 12mm hole in there. So I could use a bigger one again for 16, 20, 25. Um, my hardy and my anvil is 30, so there's no need for that one. And then my swage block has the larger sizes in it again. So you don't really need uh, larger bolsters once you get onto those. It's also handy to have a couple of different size punches and you, ideally you want different sizes and shapes. Um, so that's about six mil on the end. Uh, this one that I uh, was punching the original holes with is about eight mil on the end. Uh, I think I've got one which is about 12. Um, I don't typically go much bigger than that. Um, if you want to maximize the swelling on your holes, what I strongly suggest um, is that you go in with a slot punch. So it's a rectangular punch with the corners radius off as well. Um, and then what I tend to do is take my square drift and actually forge that into a chisel taper at the bottom. Uh, and that will maximize the amount of swelling you get on the size of your punched holes. So lots of fun facts for you today. Um, hope you found this video informative and useful. Let us know in the comments what you think. Let us know what you want to see next. I can make all sorts of blacksmithing tools. Um, and as always, guys, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram. You can support the channel through Patreon. Hopefully you click like and subscribe and we'll see you here next time on the channel. Cheers, guys.